Bonjour à tous. Eh bien, pour une fois, j'ai le plaisir de m'exprimer en français dans cet environnement britannique que j'aime tant. Euh, et donc, vous pouvez m'entendre sans accent franglais. Uh, but for the rest, it, I'm afraid it will be like that. It will sound like that. And welcome everyone for Beyond the Grid with Cyril Habitable, obviously. Hi everyone and welcome to Beyond the Grid, presented by the new Bose noise cancelling headphones 700. My name is Tom Clarkson and joining me this week is a Formula One team boss who, as you'll already have gathered from his introduction, is French. He's also extremely articulate and in charge of one of the sport's grandee teams. I'm talking, of course, about Renault team principal Cyril Abitable. Cyril has been the man at the helm of Renault since they returned to F1 as a constructor in 2016. But he's been a Renault employee for much longer, almost since his university days in Grenoble, in fact. Cut him and he'll probably bleed the Renault diamond. He might only be 41 years old, but Cyril already has a heap of F1 experience. He worked closely with Renault during its previous stint as a constructor in the noughties, both in Enstone and at their engine base in Paris. And he was also team principal of Caterham F1. Cyril has been tasked with rebuilding Renault's F1 operation, and the team's fourth and fifth places at Monza a few weeks back were welcome boosts for drivers Daniel Ricciardo and Nico Hülkenberg, as well as the teams at Enstone and in Paris. Cyril and I caught up in Singapore last weekend to talk all things Renault, his views on their current form, their much-touted five-year plan, hiring Daniel Ricciardo and Esteban Ocon, and a lot more. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Cyril, welcome to the show. Lovely to have you on. Um, and congratulations on that result at Monza, fourth and fifth. How much of a relief was that? Well, look, it's, uh, it's always, always a relief because uh, we had uh, that something that we've been uh, work, working extremely hard to, to achieve. And um, I'm not just thinking about the engine side, and but also the, the chassis side. You know, there's been a lot of uh, uh, critics uh, regarding our season. Uh, I know that uh, we created a lot of expectation uh, with um, things that have been said, but also with some decisions, some recruitments, high-profile recruitments. Uh, Daniel being one, but there's been other things also. Um, so yeah, it's it's been really a hell of a, of a season, really a proper roller coaster. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, lost opportunities and uh, having that one nailed down uh, it's great it's great for the team it's great for the morale but having said that it's also uh, to a certain degree nothing really uh, it's it's a mix of something if i'm perfectly honest a bit bitter because on one hand there is nothing really special because hey at the end of the day it's still p4 and p5 and we should only celebrate when it's p1 so yes, it's a step, but it's also a step that we know was we knew was possible and would have been possible before. So it's also a demonstration of the things that we've not achieved, and also a sign of uh, all the work that remains to be done, so that we can properly celebrate when we are on the on the first step of uh, of the podium, which has to be the the aim if you if you compete in a in a sport in any sport. So to me, it was great, but also a little bit bitter. What's it like being the boss? of the Renault Formula One team, do you feel that you've got the weight of France on your shoulders? I definitely have some weight. And is that the weight of France? I don't know. Um, I don't think that Renault, uh, you know, is France or France is Renault. Uh, but there is definitely the weight of uh, first uh, a great legacy in the sport uh, because Renault has achieved a lot. Uh, we belong to the sport, despite the fact that it's been a, a bit of uh, also of a different type of journey, being, uh, you know, sometimes full team and sometimes just engine suppliers. So, but it's more than 40 years of history in the sport. So that's clearly some weight. There is also the weight of uh, the expectation. There is a weight of what we cost to the company, to Renault. We cost a lot. And in a world that's changing a lot, uh, we, uh, you know, car makers, industry is facing a number of challenges. So amongst all the challenges that car makers need to address, Formula One is a bit of a luxury. And I have that uh, very much at the top of my head and trying to make sure that we, we use the money that uh, the financial resources that we have uh, uh, wisely. And that's uh, clearly a weight. And there is a, the fact that people really also don't understand why we, this is taking so long, why we are struggling that much. We are in a world where um, Things need to happen immediately, very quickly, instantaneously, and uh, without any sort of filter. And that world, 
the world of media, of the fan, is also weight. So all of that is a lot of weight for me, but I'm sure it's the same for all the bosses in, in, in Formula One. I guess it's a pressure you welcome. It's pressure we welcome, but it's pressure that needs to be turned into, um, into energy. And uh, we need to make sure that this pressure is not leading to making wrong decisions at wrong time. Uh, because without, with this type of pressure, it's very easy to, to fool yourself and start making decisions based only on pressure. And that's clearly not what needs to be done if you want to, to build a, a successful team. That's certainly not, for instance, what Mercedes have done. I think Mercedes have been able, you know, uh, when they were struggling, a period that everyone tends to forget, you know, they were uh, Michael Schumacher was their driver, they had fantastic lineup, good resources, and, and yet they were struggling, but they've been capable of remaining stable, steady, um, focused, determined, without, uh, without uh, having to... Uh, uh, to answer to the to the pressure, and that's how they manage to build the team that we know today. So pressure is good, but needs to be managed. And I guess that's also my responsibility to to make sure that I uh, uh, that I'm, I'm acting a bit as like a damper between the pressure of the outside world and the team internally. But you know, being a damper sometimes it sort of uh, warns you out. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. So don't let pressure make you focus on the short term, keep the focus on the medium and long term. There is that, but it can't be only that, you know, it can't be, you know, look elsewhere or look further away. Don't, don't, don't even look at what's happening right now because it's no indication of uh, what will happen in the future. No, I think it needs to be a balance of what we do uh, and what we achieve on the short term and, um, and therefore the guarantee that it gives to everyone that the medium to long term will be, will be better. I, I don't think you can expect in this world again and given, uh, uh, you know, given what's going on, to have a blank check from uh, shareholders, from sponsors, from the, from the fans and saying, you know, look guys, come back in three years, we will be so much better. No, uh, that's why it's so important in my opinion to have intermediate milestone before that ultimate milestone of being f capable of fighting for wins and for championship against which you can be measured and against which your progress can be measured. That's why going back to that P4, P5 of Monza, is definitely an inter interesting milestone to demonstrate some progress, but still so much to be done. Does Renault have to win to stay in Formula One long term? I, I think so. Frankly, the sport is going in the right direction and we have all indications it's going in the right direction. Uh, Renault has no reason to, you know, pull out from the sport that we have just rejoined three, three years ago. But, you know, it's the same situation for us for all teams. We've got contract until end of 2020. There is a, a good work stream going on for what's going on for after that, for 2021. And to me, it looks like 2021 onwards will be only better against uh, what we have today. So if we are in the spot today, there is no reason that uh, we get out when it's better from a financial perspective, from a technical perspective, and, and so on and so forth. We believe in, in, in the new uh, uh, owners. We believe in the measures that are being implemented. The thing is that we are always going back to the same problem, which is time. Time is, 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 is going to take time to reform Formula One, just like it's taking time to reform Renault Formula One. And uh, we need to make sure that people understand that and are prepared for that. Are you still on schedule? Because I think when, when Renault came back in, in in 16, you talked about a five-year plan. Is that right? Yeah, correct. We we sort of give us gave ourselves three years to build the team, and uh, and then from that point onward, being able to to start attacking, getting closer from top teams, and being able for to fight for 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 podiums and for and for wins. So basically, uh, the plan was to be able to fight for for championship by by 2021. Um, frankly, are we completely in line with that plan? Depends. Depends on the areas. For instance, driver lineup, yes, probably. Engine wise, yes. Probably we need to, to improve reliability, but I have all the confidence that just like we fix uh, performance this year, reliability will be fixed next year. And therefore, by 2021, we will have uh, uh, one of the best, if not the best engine on, on the grid. Clearly, it's taking a bit more time than expecting on the chassis side. No, no, no offense to, uh, to the team in, in Enstone, which is doing a, a great job. But um, I think we underestimated the time it would take to reform uh, a good team in, in that area. We sort of uh, underestimated two aspects. Uh, the first one probably is a massive investment that, that is still going on into the top teams. So basically, we are not very far now from where, where they were in 2015, when we sort of benchmarked what- In terms of the budget. In terms of budget, in terms of number of people, in terms of facilities. But what we have underestimated is the pace at which they would keep on investing 
on a yearly basis. And therefore, we are still very far today from where they are today. We are close from where they were in 2015. So that's the first thing. And the second thing also that we sort of underestimated is the time that it's taking also to get the right people. I mean, just insane the contractual uh, protection uh, that uh, top teams have put in place uh, to, to protect their talent. You know, that's fair, that's fine, that's legal. But sometimes you talk to a guy and uh, you can only get him three years later. So that's not really, that's something that we did not really factored into the equation. So uh, that's, I guess, the excuse part, which I don't like, but uh, it's a fact. Um, so that, which means that uh, it's a fact that we are a bit behind in terms of construction of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a proper and very competitive chassis, but there are areas of the chassis that are working extremely well. For instance, the mechanical part of the chassis is good, and there will be much more coming for 2021 for the new regulation. I think it's still the aero that is a bit behind, but we have done so much investment, for instance, in the wind tunnel over this, this summer, so much, so much investment, which meant that uh, the wind tunnel had to be shut down for uh, longer than the summer shut down. Um, which means that no development could be carried on as uh, for 2019. So there is a bit of delay, uh, but having said that, there is, uh, we are still, in my opinion, in line to have a, a competitive team for the period 2021-2024. But Cyril, it seems to me that Renault have always fought smart. You've never had the biggest budgets, even when you were winning in the mid, you know, 2005, 2006. You didn't have the same budget as McLaren. You didn't have the same budget as Ferrari. Do you think it's still possible to win a championship without being one of the absolute heavyweights in terms of resources? No, if, if you ask me, it's absolutely impossible to, uh, to, to, to do that today. Formula One has changed between the period that you're mentioning and, and today. And that's why the measures that we are talking about for 2021 onwards are so important. You know, it can't just be a, a race uh, for who has the biggest budget. I mean, it's not really interesting. If you look at uh, the grid order, if you look at the size of the budget, you've got pr pretty much uh, a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, and again, so that's, that's not really, really interesting. Um, I think in 25, 6, 2005, 2006, we are benefiting of the fact that uh, you had two biggest different performance differentiators. You had the tires, you, you had to use the Michelin tires uh, and drivers. Uh, we are very lucky to have uh, Fernando and probably in, the, in his greatest period at the time, a reasonable aerodynamic base. And all of that was enough, uh, irrespective of the budget, uh, almost, to, uh, to have a, a competitive team. Today, it has changed. It's all about the pace at which you can bring update to the, to the car, the size, uh, the firepower that you have at, at the factory. Um, so clearly, in that, in that, in that game, uh, to a certain degree, we can't compete, or at least we can't win. But that's why, <coughs> one, one of you were asking about uh, the commitment, the long-term commitment, that, that has to change. But that has to change not just for us, it has to change for, for everyone. Otherwise, you pretty much lock out the picking order that you have cu currently and you lock this out for the next uh, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, until such times that someone thinks actually it's not really interesting and attractive. And without uh, you know, mentioning anyone, even some people within the top team are thinking, is it really relevant? to spend what we are spending to even even if we are dominating, is it really relevant? So I think that for the sake of Formula One, for the sake of all the participants and ultimately for the sake of the fan, it, it has to change. And in my opinion, it will change. Let's talk about Cyril the man. First of all, did you ever want to be a racing driver? Driver, you mean? Yeah. Driver, no. No, no. I think that uh, I love I love speed. I love competition. I love sports. Uh, I'm super competitive, uh, but no, no, driver myself, no, I think uh, I measure uh, the difference between a driver and, uh, and the rest of the world. So um, I love driving, I love cars, but a racing driver myself, no. Even as a kid, no, no posters of Gilles Villeneuve on the wall <laughs> or anything like that? No, look, I was, I was watching every single race and I was uh, admiring those guys, but uh, no, frankly, never struck me that I could be one of them. Uh, maybe uh, airplanes, things like that, for some reason. But not driver, if I'm honest, and answer is, is no, but I definitely uh, have, a, have a passion for, for that environment and for the people behind. What sparked your interest in Formula One? There is not one single element. It's really the mix, it's a blend uh, that we have in Formula One of all, uh, you know, the technology, the, tech, the technology, I really love that. The fact that we are tech companies fighting against each other every other week, I really like that. Um, we are in the world of technology, but you know people are not directly competi competing uh, on one battleground. You know, it's through uh, it's through the customers, it's through market share. 
in our case, it's not that. We, we, we are fighting on, on one racetrack and that's uh, fantastic, the pace at which we are capable to find ideas, innovation, solutions. I love that. And the, frankly, the people you meet in Formula One. It's, uh, it sounds a little bit uh, politically correct, but that's, that's real. You find people that are just amazing, mind-blowing, um, you know, and uh, all united for around the same, same passion. Um, the build-up of the race weekend, I love that. The championship. Uh, all that's going on also off track, I love that. It's not one single element again, it's, um, it's so rich. Um, you know, you, you're not, I, I think there is very little uh, business or environment in the world that offers such a, a complexity and such a diversity. How much of a racer are you? Do you get nervous before the start? <laughs> massively. <laughs> really, yeah. yeah. Yeah, massively, you know. Uh, uh, no, the, the biggest demonstration is that is the, tech, the time it takes me to recover from a race weekend. You know, it's um, you know I don't sleep uh, for two nights or something like that after a race weekend. What and adrenaline or, or just uh, going through it in your yeah, mind? Exactly, good things, bad things. Exactly, all of that, and uh, and that's difficult because you know, I think twenty one races, twenty two races. That's quite so a lot. That's, of that's going to be a lot. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> that will be a lot of sleepless <laughs> nights. No, no, it's, uh, it's something that I live uh, physically and, um, you know, I'm very uh, more than French. I'm even Latin in relation to that. So I also have a tendency to, to express my, uh, uh, my emotions, my feelings, my reaction. Uh, I know that sometimes I should be able to, uh, to do a bit uh, less of that and I'm trying to work on that. But uh, frankly, uh, if, I, if I don't let it out, it's not going to be tonight. It's going to be a whole week that I don't sleep. And if you have back to back, then it means it's, it's a long time without sleeping. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm a racer. I have lots of anxiety, but I, I need to, to deal with it. So when you went to the, was it the Grenoble Institute of Technology? Did you have motor racing in the back of your mind or was it aeroplanes as you mentioned a moment ago? Or? It was... Uh, or did you have a plan? No, there was no plan. There was no plan. It would be uh, reinventing the story to say that there was a plan, but there was uh, a, a feeling that uh, I wanted to work you know, the mix of technology and sports was already on the back of my mind. I mean, I love Formula One. I love other sports like, uh, uh, you know, skiing, like windsurfing a lot. And uh, at the time, I have I had a little bit of that in my mind, working on the new technology, new materials. Uh, for skis or, or for, for... For windsurfing, skiing, you know, all the composites. That was already something, uh, yeah, you know, that I was kind of thinking without really planning for it. And yeah, when, when, when Formula One came across my, my path, which was a bit of a coincidence, frankly, uh, obviously that blown away any other type of, uh, of project. Uh, but uh, no, and I guess that my, my, uh, my schools were, were useful in the fact that I, I'm not an engineer completely, uh, ex except by, by training, but I do understand a little bit of what people are, are telling me. And I'm trying to be able to separate what sounds real and what sounds a little bit of, uh, of crap to me. So that's a bit helpful. <laughs> And of course, when you're in Grenoble, I suppose you're equidistant between Dijon, Monaco, Manicourt. Did you go to any races when you were a I student? did, to, to, yeah, to Manicourt, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. But there was no F1 races at the time in Dijon. Right? It was not such a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah, I'm feeling old, but not that, that old yet. <laughs> we'll get back to Cyril in just a minute. But before we do, I've got a little something that will interest you stat fans. We all know that the greatest Formula One drivers in the world can make the most difficult race look easy. But what really happened? Did they take the safest option or outsmart their opponents because they risked everything? Well, Amazon Web Services AWS has the answer. F1 uses AWS to create critical race performance statistics, make race predictions and give fans insight into the split second decisions made by teams and drivers. Now F1 can pinpoint how a driver is performing and share these insights over television and digital platforms all over the world. The delivery of these new race metrics will absolutely change the way you, the fans and teams, experience racing. For example, knowing when to pit can be a race-changing moment, right? Just think of Sunday's 2019 Singapore Grand Prix, pitting before Charles Leclerc won Sebastian Vettel that race. Well, the pit strategy battle function shows the predicted gap between two drivers after pit stops and the percentage chance of an overtake, all while analysing the potential success or failure of a manoeuvre, providing you with the added insight into how to assess how successful each driver's strategy will be, all in real time. And it gets better. The battle forecast lets you delve into a developing driver battle during the race that otherwise is not always so obvious. 
It does that by analyzing track history and projected driver pace, flagging up the potential overtaking opportunities across the racetrack. So suddenly you have info at your fingertips about all the battles in the field and not just the battle for the lead. But F1 isn't the only company that's using AWS. If your business needs cloud services, artificial intelligence and machine learning computer power or other functionality, then AWS can help your business transform for the future. So next time you're watching your favorite F1 driver and wondering how they get all those awesome insights, just remember, AWS is how. And you can find out more at aws.com slash F1 insights. That's aws.com slash F1 insights. Now let's get back to Cyril. Now look, you then join Renault in 2001 and you kind of work, you, I think your story is in a way quite similar to Stefano Domenicali because he started in the HR department at Ferrari and then ended up being the team principal. Do you see the parallels I'm seeing in terms of, I think you started on the website, was it? And then Yeah, on, on, on e-business activities, yes. It's, um, I mean, it was not just website, but yes, it was also that. I mean, we, we did lots of, of things at the time. That sounds obvious today, but, uh, you know, uh, 15 years, uh, 18 years ago, it, it was very far from, from obvious, you know, online store, uh, data streaming, all of that was, was really, you know, innovation at the time. And this is what you joined Renault to do? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, some of that, yeah, really pushing what, you know, it was uh, early days, not the first days, but early period of, of internet and the way that it would impact the way that business is, is done, you know, from, from procurement to uh, engineering to, uh, uh, you know, employee engagement and so on and so forth. So, yeah, and, and, and I was, you know, approached by Formula One people to think about the way to structure uh, rights and, and see how it could be leveraged uh, uh, against um, um, Bernie at the time already. Um, so I've done a bit of that and, and so, so much more. So, but yes, I think you, uh, I, I agree with your point that in the sense that uh, I am uh, the product of, uh, of, uh, of a progression in, into a company, a big company, which has is positive and is negative. And I can see that uh, uh, it's also, uh, it's, it's not easy to, to, you know, to progress in a company because you still have, you still need to carry the image of your holidays, of your first position. You know, we're here 2019 Singapore and you're talking to me about your, my first intern, internship at Renault. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. I've, yeah, why not? Yeah, I've, I have no problem. I have absolutely no problem with that. But uh, it's at some point you also need to be able to to put that behind and to put that image behind because otherwise it's because it's oh, also a world where you need to be respected and uh, uh, and uh, accepted uh, in in your new position. And it's true that a lot of people that were higher up into the chain at the time uh, are, are now reporting to me in one way or another, and that creates. Uh, a challenge from a management perspective. That's why sometimes it's better to move in a different company uh, if you want really to, to progress because you don't have to deal with, with the past. But you know, that's uh, it's an extra challenge. But it's also an extra sign of, uh, of the loyalty and the belief of Renault in myself and the loyalty that I have for, uh, for Renault, even in difficult, uh, in difficult time, even in a challenging environment. Because you've been around Formula One for so long, as you say, the Bernie era, you were dealing with him back then. How do you think the sports changed? in the last 10 years? Well, maybe I will surprise you, but I think the sport is, to a certain degree, is better. I think it's, um, I think it's, so a lot of races have become really spectacular. Um, and I regret that sometimes we don't see it. I think there is a, there is a, a general trend to, uh, to criticize uh, our sport, um, or a feeling that um, it should be better, it needs to be better. And sometimes I wonder if we are not expecting too much uh, out of racing, out of Formula One in particular. But uh, when you look at the other racing series in the same period of time, uh, you know, five years ago, uh, I don't remember exactly when, you know, everyone was talking about Le Mans. Where is Le Mans now? I love Le Mans. I love WEC, but where is it? Um, I'm not such an expert about the uh, American races or series, but uh, we see that they're struggling also. So the very fact that Formula One still exists, 10 teams, a number of car makers, I think it's public domain that is generating something like between 1.5 and 2 billion in, in revenue. That's, you know, you can talk about the distribution, but uh, it's quite amazing. And, uh, and just, you know, from a fan perspective, we've had a number of races this year that have just been absolutely fantastic. You've seen some stars emerging like Max, like Charles uh, over the past few years, still the domination of Lewis, 
That's fantastic storytelling. And I, I, I sometimes don't understand. And, uh, you know, no one would uh, critique football. Uh, or, or no one would critique uh, basketball for, for, for what it is. And the difficulty in our sport is that the regulations are, are, are changing so quickly that uh, everyone feels or can have a say in thinking that by doing something different on the regulation, we could have a better sport. But frankly, I'm not totally sure. So, uh, well, don't get me wrong. I still believe that for the sustainability of the sport, we need the reform that we are talking about. But when it comes to Formula One itself, I think we have a great product. Uh, I think we uh, maybe uh, need to uh, manage expectation also in, in that area. Maybe we need to tailor it a bit better for the younger generation by managing to telling different stories, but it's stories that are already in there, you know, stories about technology, lifestyle. When I talk about, uh, about my company to sponsor, I really convey the message that we are a tech company because that's what we are. We are a tech company. But if you start to, you know, to position Formula One teams as tech company, you get a completely different interest from people out there, including younger generation people. So I think uh, we also need to do a better work at marketing Formula One so that people see the reality of Formula One, which is not so, not so dark, in my opinion. In terms of the racing, I think we're going through a purple patch at the minute, aren't we? It's been absolutely fantastic. And maybe it's people's expectations of Formula One that have changed, not the sport so much in terms of we've, we've always had good races and bad races. And, um, now, look, Flavio Briatore was someone else I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> talk about it's, different areas. I, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> it's like my first job at Rodo, I have Flavio Briatore. <laughs> but listen, how, what kind of an influence did Flavio have on you? Well, it's, well first, it's been massive for, uh, for, for, for my career progression because I think he is one uh, amongst other people who uh, uh, who identified uh, me as uh, uh, for, for what I could bring to, uh, to, to the team, to, um, to the company, to, uh, to Renault at the time, and to himself also. I think we, uh, we were sort of complementing well, well, extremely well each other in the sense that I was sort of, uh, uh, you know, carrying, uh, trying to carry all the information uh, uh, for him and make them available in, at any time. And, um, you know, look, it's been an inspiration. It's, um, he's, um, he's, he's fantastic in his capacity of, uh, of being driven by his emotion and his emotion are, are driven also by fantastic in intuitions. You've got, he's got, uh, intuition on, on people, on situation. Um, I mean, he's, I mean, not everything is perfect with, with Flavio, you know, but he's got that. And, uh, but uh, to a certain degree, it's also something that I can't, uh, get for myself because it's either you get it or you don't get it, you know, this type of, uh, uh, of, of intuition on, on people. But, uh, but yeah, no, look, he, he, he teach me, uh, uh, he helped me understand the, the business, the way that is structured. And very quickly I was able to have the progression that you were referring to before. It's thanks to, to Flavio and a couple of person around him. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely massive. I mean, do I admire everything in Flavio? No, but there is lots of things that, uh, for, for which he's been, he's made me a different person. So he was a kind of big picture guy, wasn't he? Ah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you would not expect him to go into, into the detail. But again, the intuition for the big picture and what needs to be done at a given time, also from a communication perspective, he, he clearly, in my opinion, modernized Formula One. Uh, so, yeah, it's, um, he, he was capable of uh, having the intuitions of where things were, were going and also being focused on one message and one message only. And you see that in that discussion, I'm absolutely unable to think on one message only. I always go into lots of, lots, lots of, of details and that's why I, I'm seeing that we were complementing each other extremely well. And so how involved were you with him in terms of the sale to Gerard Lopez when Renault pulled out? Ah, but he was not involved, I have to say, at the time because he, he, he left the company after Crashgate. Oh, after the Crashgate yeah. incident. So, yeah, of course he did. So, yeah, he, he, was, yeah. he was not there anymore. So there was an interim management in the form of Bob Bell, uh, Jean Francois Cobé at the time, and, and, and myself. And, uh, but it was an interim management mainly focused on uh, thinking about the future of the company because I think Flavio left the team in October, September of, or October 2009, if, I, if my memory is correct. Crashgate. Uh, basically went out into in, in a Spa 2009. I remember that uh, extremely well, extremely well, uh, like it was yesterday, frankly. And uh, in November 2009, we we decided to uh, to sell the team, and it was completed in uh, in December 2009. And uh, yeah, no, I was I was uh, under the instruction of uh, of Renault CEO and Renault Executive Committee. I was I was leading that process of finding an investor. 
Uh, and again, the, what we try to do at the time is to keep uh, to keep a foot in Formula One, uh, to keep uh, some involvement in Formula One on the engine side, obviously, but also trying to keep uh, a minority shareholding into into the team uh, because we are not totally sure we really wanted to to be out. But you know, there was such a conjunction of factors uh, that was very difficult to do uh, to do uh, something else than uh, than uh, than stepping out uh, partly from 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 the team. You know, uh, economic crisis uh, results. Results were very bad, sporting results, first and foremost. Um, sponsorship also, we were, we were losing on the back of uh, that crash get story that you were mentioning. So very difficult. And at the time, uh, and you had Toyota, BMW, Honda, all of them uh, went, you know, left, left the sport in one way or another. And we tried something different. And in my opinion, that's because we tried something different at the time that we are still here today. If you look at BMW or Toyota, uh, when you properly leave the sport, it's very difficult to come back. You see Honda, they managed to do a sort of a partial comeback. I would like to hope that it will be a sustainable comeback, but we also know that it's very difficult to, to stay in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a permanent manner when you are just engine uh, supplier, which we are today. We'll hear more from Cyril after this short message. In the internet age, it's easy to feel like we have all the freedom in the world. The truth, however, is that we've never been monitored more by governments, ISPs and ad companies. UK internet service providers like BT or Sky have to keep records of your online activity for 12 months. This includes all the websites you visit, apps you use and your private conversations. But now you can protect your online privacy with ExpressVPN. ISPs can record your internet activity no matter where you are in the world. And as someone who travels a lot and often finds myself darting between working from home or in cafes and hotels using public Wi-Fi, I want to feel protected and so should you. And I'm not just talking to those of you listening in the UK. If you're based in the United States, then ISPs can even sell your data to advertising companies. So the best way for you to stop them accessing your data is to use a VPN. ExpressVPN is the perfect solution. And the great thing about it is that it's so easy to set up and use in a matter of minutes. All you have to do is download the app onto your computer or phone, and that's it. You're protected. You can crack on with your day and use the internet as normal, safe in the knowledge that your data is encrypted and your IP address is hidden. And it's all thanks to ExpressVPN. So protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash grid. That's expressvpn.com slash grid for three months free with a one year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash grid to learn more. Right, let's get back to Cyril. Crashgate, you say it came out in Spa 2.9. Can you remember your reaction, how you felt when it came out? Initially, you don't believe it. You know, it was uh, relating to facts that happened uh, one year before because it happened in September 2008, actually in Singapore. So it's a perfect place to talk about that. Um, was a little bit in VR already. You know, what's fun? I tell you a little bit story. I remember one day in... Um, it was a FOTA meeting, one of those meetings, FOTA was Formula One team association, uh, one of those associations formed to, to try and get the team to work together, ne never happened, ne never will. Uh, but, uh, and at one, at one moment, there was a joke made by someone about the red button of Flavio that, that he has to call, uh, to provoke a safety car. And that was, a f I, don't, I can't remember exactly when it was, but everyone was really smiling and joking. And I look at Flavio, he was not smiling at all. <laughs> Oula, <laughs> started to think maybe there is something. And no, so, but yeah, apart from that moment, there was, uh, frankly, there was, uh, it was really difficult to, to believe and uh, to, to, you know, I don't want to reopen that story again, but um, no, it's, um, it, was, it was a shock and it's, uh, it's a sort of shock that you, you, you feel somehow that it's going to impact your business, the team, but also your life, but you're not quite sure how. Well, I guess it had an influence on Renault pulling out, or do you think it was just the financial no, I, crisis? I think, yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a, the, the last, uh, the last element making it swing again. I think the, the, the bigger picture and the financial crisis, uh, the also um, uh, the fact that a number of car makers were were leaving the sport, and again, our sporting results in my opinion, were the primary factors of, uh, of that decision. But again, when, when you're facing such a reputation crisis, you need to take measures. And we had also a, 
a management issue because uh, after Flavio, which uh, had to leave the team for, for obvious reason, there was no uh, uh, there was no succession plan really in place. So you are also facing a management crisis. Um, so all of that combined together led to to a decision that was at the time uh, quite an obvious decision. Mm-hmm. Okay, so back to you, Caterham. <laughs> I mean, how did that opportunity come about? And how much of a risk was it for you to leave Renault? Well, at the time, without going too into the details of uh, the reasons that I uh, wanted to, to leave Renault, but I was, uh, I mean, I was... I was not really comfortable staying at Renault, let's, let's put it this way. It was uh, in the years uh, leading to the new engine uh, period and I could feel that it was not going to go in the right direction. I was in no way at the time able to influence decisions that were made from, from a technical, from a financial, from an investment perspective. But it was very clear that we were, uh, we would come into, in 2014, the first year of the phase six uh, hybrid, uh, unprepared, really unprepared. And... Um, Bon, so, and uh, I was at the time uh, offered two opportunities, one, one of which. Can I say, you, yeah. you felt that back in 2011? Yeah, not 2011, 2012. I think it's 2012. As early memory. as 2012, you yeah, were feeling so. that Renault was undercooked of going course. into. But that's uh, something really, if I, if I make a more general comment, that's f- some, something that people don't feel outside of Formula One or outside of teams is really the inertia of the organization, is the inertia of, uh, of the product cycle. You know, I can tell you now the, the feelings that I have for 2021 engine and 2021 chassis. You know, obviously, everyone wants to talk about what's going to happen in the next six races that we have to go after that one. But the reality is the game that we are playing now is the 2021 game. Uh, and so back in 2012, I could see what was going on and... Uh, the amount of effort we were putting into the V8 versus the V6, what was going on in the other teams, the recruitment they were making, the investment they were making, you, 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 you get a feel for all of that. You talk to the same suppliers, you talk to the same people, you're fighting for the same skills sometimes, and it, there were all the indications of the world that we were massively, massively behind. Well, that plus the fact that I could not influence and therefore that uh, the whole relationship with the management of the time was a bit... Uh, uh, difficult. Uh, I felt that it was the right time to 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 to, to do something different, and I was offered two two opportunities. One one of which was making uh, sense because Ketram, people would not remember that, but at the time, had the joint venture with Renault for the resurrection of the Alpine brand. Actually, Alpine, the road cars that that are doing extremely well actually uh, currently. Um, uh, were done thanks also to the fact that uh, the initial project was was shared with uh, with Tony Fernandez with Ketram, so that's why uh, so the move to Ketram it's it's like I was moving but still staying a little bit in the, in the family, and perceived as uh, as something positive for, uh, for for everyone. So it, it happened, but it was a little bit of a trap. I have to I have to admit. I mean, because you were then team principal of Ketram at the age of thirty five. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you shrugged your shoulders, but I mean that's an amazing achievement. Yeah, that would have been a, that would be an achievement if I had been able to uh, to properly uh, save the team and find a, a sustainable model for the team, which which didn't happen because uh, uh, again I don't want to, to go into, uh, into into the details uh, of what happened, but uh, with, with very quickly it was very clear that the challenge was not a sporting or a technical challenge like it is at Renault today, but simply a cash flow problem and, uh, and challenge and I think to think on a weekly basis about uh, who to pay and who to left behind uh, in terms of creditors just so that you can carry on racing because if you stop racing that's it the company is finished and you've got 350 jobs that are gone uh, and therefore the, my only obsession was to think about how to keep on racing you know, it's not really exciting. It's not really, uh, it's not, it's not great. And um, and yeah, I mean, and, and still today, if you if you ask about my my own career, still today, uh, you know, I have to pay for the fact that people are under the impression that I am responsible for for uh, for the loss of of Caterham F1. And I really think that's completely not just unfair, but inaccurate. Uh, I try to arrange a sale to someone, and that someone, same circumstance took him, I think, two races to stop when I was able to carry the whole team for one year and a half. That's why it's, 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 a, bit, it's a bit unfair, but it's also a demonstration that the model of a uh, fully independent team simply does not work in the current Formula 1. We'll see in the future, but right now it does not work. So could 
the Caterham story have ended differently? Uh, if, if you ask me, of course, I will tell you now. It would, uh, but, but, but if you ask someone else, may, maybe uh, uh, come with a, with a different answer. So, uh, you know, I, pref- I always like to doubt, uh, doubt about, you know, what, what I do, what I've done. But, you know, uh, you fi- you know, the finance of Formula One teams is so demanding. There is uh, the fixed cost. The problem is the fixed cost of going Formula One racing. And, uh, you know, if your, if your fixed cost is, uh, is much higher than uh, your guaranteed income, there is absolutely no way it can, it can happen. You know, uh, the prospect of sponsorship, uh, the prospect of price fund uh, is, is so much lower than what it costs you to go Formula One racing, to build your car and so on and so forth. Uh, you've got new models emerging recently like Haas, which, which is interesting, but it's still very, very expensive for, uh, for the shareholder. It's still not a good business model. It's a good sporting model. Has has done a fantastic job, uh, and that's something that I w- had in mind to try and form an alliance with uh, with one of the existing team. Uh, that's why when when Has was formed, actually, I was happy to have the demonstration that it was working. But you still need to have a shareholder prepared to invest a large amount of money into it, and uh, and a marketing project has seems to have a marketing project. Uh, Ketchum had a marketing project, but in no way the number of sales of, of units of Ketram cars that are sold on a yearly basis can finance, can absorb the cost of going Formula, Formula One racing. So, so the, the whole purpose was not, was not there at the start, and therefore the, the financial sustainability was, was not there. But do you think the experience at Caterham makes you a better team principal now? You sort of get the big picture now. You sort of it's, can see it from it's, different angles. It's, it's a very good question. Sometimes I tend to believe that. Uh, so it brought me, uh, you know, the, the, the sense for uh, the value of things. You know, I care for the cost of things, for the way that we are spending. Uh, but is that what Renault needs in Formula One? Uh, that's that the question. Maybe sometimes I, I ask my fel- myself if I'm thinking big enough. If I, you know, should not be uh, simply uh, explaining to uh, everyone, we we need to spend twice what we are spending, uh, just because we, we want to get at uh, that level from a sporting perspective. Maybe the fact that I'm too cautious about uh, cost and value of things is delaying or holding back the progress, the ability of the team to progress. But I'm not so sure about that. I continue to believe that with twice the budget that we have today we would not be much better because it takes time to build your infrastructure. Of course, we need to be in the, at the level of Mercedes and Ferrari, but again, it takes years to recruit the people to invest into the facilities. Uh, that's why things need to happen, but if things happen too early, uh, it just, it's just uh, uh, you know, completely cost inefficient and it's not going to be also better uh, efficient from a timing perspective. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it trained me a lot, showed me a lot, uh, but I know that I'm still to prove what I'm capable of doing uh, uh, for, uh, for Renault. It's fascinating. You're constantly questioning everything, aren't you? It seems very inquisitive mind, l- looking at yourself, looking at the team, looking at the sport. That seems to be a, l- a lot of questions <laughs> out there. That's why you have lots but of it, time because I'm not sleeping. <laughs> 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 but let's... Let, well... I've got a question for you now. Ocon, Esteban Ocon, he's um, coming to Renault next year. And it's it's well known, I think, that there was almost a deal in place for him to come this year, 2019. Why take him in 20 when you could have taken him in 19? But the, first, the first part of the answer, so it's not no, of the question, it's not, ni- not 19, not 19, because we, uh, it happened that we had that opportunity that uh, everyone knows about, uh, the opportunity of, of Daniel. And uh, we simply decided to to go for it, and I think a uh, lot lot of people in the same situation would have would have been doing the same. So it's typically a Flavio decision, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> it's completely uh, emotional, maybe irrational, but that's the sort of decision that that that's good taking for 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 the team, for the sport, for Renault. So yeah, I mean, and it, if it had not been for that opportunity, clearly uh, Esteban would be driving already for us this year. So there is absolutely no no doubt about that. And uh, and as to uh, why why Esteban this year, well, because the situation and uh, Esteban has not changed, the team has not changed. I think the why the reason why he was ticking the all boxes last year are still extremely valid, if not even more, because the one thing that I want is to um, is to have a team of people composed of people who are 
starving. We really want, are desperate for, desp desperately happy already to be in that sport and uh, uh, desperate for, uh, for success. The problem in, sometimes in Formula One is that you, you have people, you know, doing very long careers in Formula One at, and at the end, you know, they are just happy to be in Formula One and almost win, uh, become secondary. And I don't want that at any point in the company, whether it's drivers, obviously. So don't get me wrong. When I'm saying that, I'm not talking about Nico because he's desperate. Nico Hülkenberg is desperate for being, for reaching that podium and those wins and he d deserves them. But I, I do feel that uh, when you are 22 in your, uh, which is the case of uh, F.S. Teban, rather than the 30s, early days of your career, a career for which you had to fight a lot, uh, Esteban, the way that he built himself, uh, what he had to prove, uh, the sacrifice also of, uh, of the people around Esteban. Uh, for me, it's, um, it's, it's a different dynamic. It's a different dynamic and the sort of dynamic that I feel is the right dynamic for, for our team, given the challenge that we are, we are, we are still facing. So if you ask me if we've taken Esteban because Esteban is simply a better driver than Nico, I'm absolutely unable to, to tell you because, you know, unless we give them exactly the same car, no one will be able to answer to, to, that, to that question. But do I believe that he fits better in the dynamic of, of our team? Uh, yes, I feel so. But equally, I feel also that it's a bit unfinished business with, with Nico, which again will be uh, one of these elements that will be better with, uh, with this season when, when, uh, when the curtain uh, uh, shot uh, in Abu Dhabi. And my goodness, Ocon is going to have a motivation next year, isn't he? He's going to want to prove to you, Cyril, that not that you back the wrong horse, but it's just, this is, you know... <laughs> I, he I, is going to want to beat Daniel Ricciardo. He, so he will much. want to beat Daniel, and yeah. I know that yeah. we will have uh, some some challenge from a driver management perspective on the pit wall to manage that. But you know, okay, I mean that's that's also a nice problem to have. Mm -hmm. Talk about the influence of of Daniel Ricciardo on the team. I mean, well, first of all, how surprised were you that he decided to come? Because it was. God, it was a long old story last year, wasn't it? He was coming, he's not coming. Is he going to stay at Red Bull? Is it going to be a two-year deal with Red Bull, a one-year deal with Red Bull? You know, it just went on and on, didn't it? How much of a shock was it when he picked up the phone to you and said, Cyril, I'm coming? <laughs> Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was a surprise. Um, it was a bit of a surprise because, you know, um, it's, we are still a young team and having a, a, a driver so accomplished like, like Daniel uh, joining a, a young team, even if we are not perceived as a young team. Uh, is is quite something, and looking also at the evolution of our driver lineup and uh, the projection of this year with with Nico and Daniel, that was something extremely exciting. But having said that, I could feel, you know, because obviously that that call did not happen by coincidence. Uh, it didn't come out of the blue. So there were uh, a number of discussions and the whole process leading into that, and discussion that started probably a, a year before that. I could feel that there was something that. Uh, not working or not clicking anymore between uh, between uh, Daniel and Red Bull, and no no disrespect for Red Bull, you know it's I, I think they're a fantastic team, but uh, uh, I think when you you feel you're left behind, you really feel it. It's not uh, halfway, and uh, I could feel that he was not happy uh, where he was. I could feel that he has a better car, and it was obvious that he had a better car than the one we would have to offer, and therefore the prospect from a pure sporting perspective were better. Uh, uh, initially at, at Red Bull. But I think, you know, Daniel also, he was at a point in his career, it was very clear when he was expecting uh, more than that uh, out of, of life. And um, I think you, I think, uh, again, I've, I've, I've read a lot of things about, about that, about that, that move. And, but I think we need to respect people who also, uh, uh, you know, have a look at the bigger picture uh, for, for themselves. So it was a surprise. But um, knowing a little bit Daniel, uh, the way that I managed to know him into that, that whole process kind of made sense for him and for us. What's impressed you about him? Oh, what, what's just amazing with Daniel, so I talk about the sport in a minute, but the f one thing that's just amazing is that you, you know, that, well, f the first thing is the way that uh, I announced him into the, the, the team. And I had never such a wave of, uh, of happiness you know, from everyone. You know, all the faces of everyone were so, so happy, but that was without him. But what, what did you do? You gathered everybody together at Enstone? <laughs> it, was, it was a bit messy because it was actually at the start of, uh, well, just before summer shutdown, after Budapest. Uh, uh, frankly, if I'm honest, I, I was already gone, but I did a, a sort of a video call uh, you know, for, for the little story. I was 
wearing my my swim uh, my swimsuit. <laughs> People could not see that because it was on, on Skype. Um, and I did I did two video conferences. When one with Viri for the people who were still around, and, and in Stone for again for the people who were, who were still around. And uh, I announced it in uh, in sequence, and that again the, the, the wave was uh, just uh, massive. Um, so that's what, what that's what I did. But you know the most impressive things with with Daniel again staying in that same area, and we'll talk about the spots uh, in a second. But uh, the first time that we introduced Daniel to the to, to the to the team, I think it's uh, December or January. I don't know, but just his smile, and everyone is with his smile is capable of bringing everyone together behind him, but also together. And he managed, in my opinion, to create a, a better team, better group of people, stronger, uh, more solid. Uh, in almost independently from him, but just to carry him forward. And that, that was a plan. And obviously a big, a huge disappointment is the fact that it's not turned into a better car this year, uh, which is a demonstration that uh, you know, the soft side is good, but we also need the hard side. Um, but um, yeah, so that's really impressive, the capacity that he has to bring people together. Did that surprise you? No. No, because you can see that when you're talking, you, I'm sure you can also say, say that f from your interviews with him. But what's just amazing is that it's is really in real life what it looks like. And there is absolutely no portraying, no posturing. It's not a character that is playing. It is like that. It, it is what it is. And I think that's very, very much Australian. So that's that was not a huge, huge surprise. And um, no, and what's the surprise also is uh, each time we've been capable of giving him a decent car this year, Montreal, Monaco, Spa Monza, his ability to, to nail it down and to extract so much out of the car, that's, that's really insane. Uh, but I think it's, it's fair to say that we need to give him a proper car. And the, when the car is not so strong, he's struggling, struggling a, bit, a bit more. Um, but really, when, when the car is good, he's, he's extracting um, an awful lot and with such a consistency, uh, such also an honesty, uh, the way that we can build strategy with him, uh, you know, on, the abilities that he got to, to judge tires in particular, and we know that in our sport it's so important. You know, we, you know the, the work of the guy uh, from strategy is so much easier with, with, with him. We know exactly where we're standing. Um, that's quite remarkable and it's just, you know, another either frustration or motivation uh, to give him uh, as quickly as possible a better car so that we can properly uh, leverage what he has to offer. So what have you got to do? Is that what you've got to do to keep him beyond 2020? It's really early to, to start thinking and talking about that. But yes, that's, that's what we need for, for him, but not just for him, for, for everyone. Uh, so that's the focus. The difficulty that we will be facing is that there, is, there will be such a breakthrough between 2020 and 2021, first from a regulation perspective, but also in terms of amount of work. If, if I'm honest, we've already fairly advanced into 2021 car preparation and I expect that we really do a, a massive step, a bit like we've done on the engine side this year. I expect we do the same type of step uh, uh, between 20 and 21, but it's a question of credibility. It took us a result like Monza, not just for you to interview me, but also for people to actually start believing what we were seeing about the engine. And that will be the same question of credibility when, for instance, I will be discussing with Daniel next year about 2021. What will be my credibility in telling him that we will be able to accomplish that step? That's why I'm going back to the start of our discussion, having those intermediate milestones. For instance, let's say this year, it was the engine performance, competitiveness. It's so important, not just from a sporting perspective, but also to establish the credibility for the future milestones to give you the time, but also to give you the credibility that what you will do in the future will actually happen in the way that you, you say it, it will happen. So I think, yeah, we, he needs a better car, but he needs also to see that uh, before 2021, there is, there is progression and that we are able uh, to demonstrate that we understand what we're doing. It's, this year has been disappointing. Next year has to be already uh, a bit better. I mean, he's talking about podiums next year, isn't he? Is, is that where you're... Yes, we like to do that, but, uh, but would you beat? You know, you have uh, six cars that are extremely competitive. Uh, so you need to beat uh, a number of these cars to be, to be on, on the podium. So yes, it, it has to be the target. The engine, in my opinion, will be uh, competitive. Um, so the chassis just needs to, to, to improve. Our difficulty in, in next year preparation will be the balancing of the resources between 2021 and 2020. You know, this year has been very di difficult because we had to, for the first time, for the first time, to work on three cars in parallel, 19, 20, and because 21 is so important, so we were working also on 21, 
Uh, next year will be a bit easier, but again, because the expectation is such for 2021, we will be more, working more than usually towards the following year car, so the 2021 car. So we will have to balance everyone's expectation, including Daniel's expectation towards 20, against also what needs to be done for 21. What about the paddock politics? Because the two drivers that you've going to have in 2020 has ruffled a few feathers getting them in terms of getting Daniel, I think, caused Red Bull a bit of pain. Getting Ocon or not getting him in 19 caused problems maybe with Toto Wolf. How hard do you have to be to do what you do? Do you worry about your relationships with Toto Wolf, Christian Horner, etc.? No, you can't, because if you start to do that, it means that you start to compromise on what you need to do for your own team. Uh, you, you, you need to be, uh, in my opinion, to do the, a proper job. You need not to worry about that, and you need not to worry about your image. Um, and the two can go together because, you know, uh, people like Christian, people like Toto are very powerful in terms of, you know, public opinion, uh, making or uh, doing or undoing. And I know that. But uh, no, I, I think you need to be, uh, to be extremely loyal to your team, to your uh, company, to your brand. My brand uh, and employer is, is Renault. It's not Mercedes. It's, it's not Red Bull. But having said that, it's also a fact that uh, uh, you, you sometimes need to work uh, in partnership with, with other people. That's why Formula One is also so in interesting because you can have, uh, you know, we are all competing against each other, but sometimes they are your partner, their customer, your customer, your suppliers. Uh, you know, for instance, we buy some facility services from, from Mercedes. Uh, we've obviously been selling engine to uh, McLaren or to uh, Red Bull. So that's why it's, it's, it's so complex. It's complex. But I think everyone understands that uh, the, the rule number one has to be uh, loyal to your, to your team. And uh, because things fluctuate, uh, we all know that the, alliance, uh, the alliances of, of one day do not uh, mean alliances for, forever. And circumstances change very quickly, like Bernie Woos would say at the time. <laughs> he would. But how difficult was it to get the Ocon deal back on the table with Toto? Because it was actually here last year. I remember Toto being quite outspoken about you and the deal not happening. And uh, No, look, I, uh, I think Toto is someone that likes to, uh, to control... Uh, most of what he can control, and including obviously his, his driver, and for for once, uh, the situation went uh, out out of his of his control. And I have to accept the fact that it was done, you know, very quickly, and uh, he had little time to anticipate, and and therefore to go back into control. That's why you know that's why I have no real problem with uh, what was said at the time. And and what's great is that uh, everyone has been capable of putting that behind, and focusing on one thing and one thing only, which is. Uh, uh, which is the, really what's what's good for Esteban and also for Renault and maybe on medium to long term for for Mercedes, but you know uh, finding a way forward for for Esteban is important for for what Mercedes is trying to build with also with his junior program. Um, so I'd like to to mention a, a man who's been instrumental into all of that. It's Gwen Gwen Lagru, uh, who's looking after uh, the junior program of of Mercedes. Uh, we've been discussing since uh, since months about that and the process and also the traps to avoid so that we do not do a repeat of what happened last year. Because last year is not just, oh, of course, there is a Daniel opportunity. But before that, there's been something else, which I will not mention between, uh, but I will just mention McLaren because it's, they, were, they were in the hair, who made the situation a bit even more complex with, with, with Ocon. So that's typically the sort of things where we learned from last year and we made sure not to reproduce the same and have a, a smooth process leading to that decision, which is a good decision for everyone. I think I remember hearing that Ocon had a seat fit at McLaren, didn't he? Or something. But, um, but yeah, there were lots of pressure put by McLaren into that, yeah. and that was not helpful. <laughs> yeah, not helpful at all. <laughs> um, is Ocon still a Mercedes driver? Is he on a bungee back to Toto? Well, he's, I mean, I, I, I talk about the fact, uh, but he's, our contract is with, is with Mercedes. It's his management company. But what I can tell you is that in that contract, which is confidential, obviously, but Mercedes has absolutely no right on him. Uh, so they can't, uh, he's not a reserve driver of Mercedes, he's not a simulator driver. Uh, information are extremely confidential. Um, so, yeah, no, he's, he's, he's a Renault driver, but it happens that his management company is Mercedes. And I guess that when his contract expires with us, 
uh, and if option uh, uh, is lapsed, then Mercedes could decide to could elect to, to take him for sure. Uh, but just like he could go somewhere else. So um, yeah, that's but that's only it. then. Yeah, only then, not before. Yeah, um, we're talking about young drivers. When will we see someone from your driver academy in Formula One? It's it's a good question, and it's um, it's it will be at the same time uh, you know important and uh, an important test for, for us because we formed the academy in 2016 with our single objective to uh, being able to bring one or, or several drivers to to Formula One. Uh, the plan there was a plan also was a five year plan, as, which which uh, brings us to 2021. And well, if you look at the drivers we have, it it, it could happen. I have to mention at this point, obviously, the the tragic loss of one of of, of them, uh, Antoine, uh, who probably would have been one of the first one to uh, uh, you know to be eligible uh, to be promoted to to Formula One. So that's obviously having an impact to to, to the plans. But uh, we have we have great drivers in. Uh, in particular, uh, well, I don't want to give any particular pick in order, but we have Joe uh, Guanzhou in, in, in F2, who's doing a remarkable job, uh, much better than a lot of people were expecting, frankly. So we need to think carefully about what he will be doing uh, next year. How uh, exciting is it to have a, a, a good Chinese driver on the cusp of Formula 1? Uh, it's, 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 in, uh, look, it's interesting. It's also a demonstration that um, when you take the time to build and not to burn the steps, it, it can happen. I think there's been a number of attempts before. Uh, we were not, you know, uh, happening in logical order. So you were trying to find someone who knew roughly how to drive, was ticking the bus, box of being Chinese for the abuse, uh, you know, that it can bring from, a, you know, in terms of marketing and so on and so forth. But was not the right way forward. Our, our approach is really to look for very young people and accept the time that it will take uh, to uh, to train them and to bring them at, at the right level. It's not totally true for, for Joe having said that because it sort of came joined for a bit later the, the academy. But that's really our, our our mindset is to start early and accept uh, and accept the process. Uh, but that's very exciting. But we have also more uh, extremely exciting people like uh, Christian Longard, Max Futrell, uh, and, and some others, Caio Collet, uh, Victor Martins. So we've got very, very exciting people coming. And it will only only based on, on, on talent and on merit that they will be able to be promoted into the upper ladder of, uh, of the feeder series. Uh, 2021, 2022 is a possibility to... Uh, With have, your own team? Or could you, would you place them... Well, that's that's a challenge that we are facing. Uh, the natural way forward would be to be able to place them, but uh, it, it, we know it's going to be a challenge because there are not that many teams out there. In my opinion, uh, Formula One is missing one uh, or two teams. You know, the, the minority of these of these days uh, are equivalent that were fantastic. Uh, you know, training and uh, platform and proving platform for 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 young drivers. We don't have that. To be honest, it's not going to happen with McLaren. I'm not going to turn to Zach and tell him, you know what, take my junior <laughs> driver. No, I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, and that's frankly a very valid question mark for, for us. So, you know, if we have no other option and we've got a, a confidence level that's high enough, why not us? Why not our team directly? But it means that we must be even more draconian uh, about the conditions to fulfill from a performance perspective to stay into the academy and then to be promoted into F1 with our own team. Okay, well, look, first practice session is about to get underway here in Singapore. So I think I better let you go. Cyril, thank you very much for your time. Great to chat. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Being an F1 team boss is a real juggling act, isn't it? Cyril is constantly trying to find short-term solutions to problems while also dealing with long-term strategy decisions and the corporate demands of big business. And for someone still relatively young, he's had to deal with his fair share of frustrations and disappointments as well, and he clearly wears the pressure on his shoulders, not sleeping for two days after a race. That shows you how much Formula One runs through his veins. It'll be fascinating to see what happens next in Cyril's F1 story and how long it takes Renault to get back to the front. Thanks for your time, Cyril. It was great to catch up, and thanks too to Renault. Well, that's it for another episode, but we'll be back next week with another big name from the world of F1. In the meantime, there's just time to say a big thank you for all your feedback on our episode with Jos Verstappen. Aside from what he said about his own racing career, you clearly found Jos most fascinating when he talked about his son, Max. 
The absolute biggest supporter of Max Verstappen is Jos, says Luca D.E. You have to listen to the episode to understand how much Max's career means to Jos. It's one of the best episodes of Beyond the Grid yet. Well, thank you, Luca D.E., for your feedback. You certainly have a point as well. Is Jos the best racing dad in the history of the sport? And please keep the feedback coming. We love it. Remember to use the hashtag F1BeyondTheGrid and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>